Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of eCoffee with Expert. This is your host, Swanmay here. And today we have Travis, who is the founder and CEO at Glide with us. Hey, Travis. Howdy. It's good to be here. Lovely. Travis, before we dive into and into us understand more about Glide and about your journey, why don't you take us through about how do you start uh, Glide and what made you start Glide and how are things now? And, and why, how did you land in the web development digital marketing space? How has been your journey? How does it look like? Yeah. Yeah. So I started the company in the year 2000. I got my degree in architecture from Texas A&M and honestly just loved all things digital. I, I've been on a computer since I was seven years old and just always enjoyed being on the cutting edge of digital in all shapes and forms. And so Glide was a natural kind of outcropping of that. Also, I think I just have a high level of autonomy. So out of college, got a degree in architecture, but decided to go into graphic design. And so I was a graphic designer at an internet startup, the dot-com bubble burst, and I found a job at a tech startup that was thankfully hiring at the time. And it wasn't a couple of years before I realized I just wanted to go off on my own. Started a company briefly, but that was something similar to Vimeo, video for the web, a real-time video transcription for the web, or, but then started Glide and been doing that for a long time. And so Glide was really birthed out of just being on my own and, and doing things the way that I wanted to do. And when we started Glide, it was all about build amazing websites, create raving fan clients, and really ultimately deliver bottom line results. So I think early on, I remember reading a book called Web Design for ROI, and it like opened my eyes to this concept that's like making websites for people is not just, oh, I get to do this thing that I enjoy, which is design and development and the web and digital. It's This will tangibly help the bottom line of an organization. And so pretty early on, just using that kind of form and function, the architectural brain of left and right and balance, which is, okay, beauty and science, right? It looks great, but it also performs well. And it's... Part of this question, the turning points that shaped me over the time, is that kind of what you're alluding to? Lovely. And then uh, what, what were the turning points uh, for you, Travis, as an agency owner that kind of shaped your agency into what it is today? Yeah, that's something I've thought a lot about over the years and had some time to think about. I think for me, started the agency in 2003, 2015. I was feeling like I was in a rut. In fact, I think at one point I was ready to just, just do something totally different. I was like, you know what? I, I think I might go and be uh, like a coach for high school football or something like that. <laughs> just shut it down. I felt like I was going through the motions, just really the same thing over and over. And at the time we were a very small agency. I had just a handful of folks. I was doing all of the project management, all of the sales, all of the administration and management of the company I had maybe a, a designer or two and in, in a couple of developers. But 2015, I saw a TED Talk by Simon Sinek called Start With Why. And obviously he wrote this book, but the TED Talk's 10 minutes a week when we're palatable. And it just, I think the concept of that talk was people don't really care what you do or how you do. They care why you do it. And he had that golden circle. And it was just this concept of just understanding like, why do I do what I do? And And, and it was just a, interesting question because I always thought it was to make amazing websites and to create raving fan clients and to deliver bottom line results. And then I realized that's not why I get up in the morning. And so I just went through this whole process over a period of two years where I was just asking that question constantly. And the answer I finally came to was my personal why. And when I came to that, it really changed everything for me and it helped clarify a lot. So my personal why is to, to work with great people, to work for great people, to do meaningful work, and to make a difference on my terms. And when I came to that statement, there was like someone ring a bell. And I was like, you know what? I'm not really going to be able to improve that. I just want to make that statement more true every day until the day I die. And so it's not so much about what company do I work at or do I sell this company? Or do I build it or whatever? It's just, can I make that more true uh, over time? And I think that was a really big turning point. And it allowed me to reinvest into the business and really look at what I was doing and how I was doing it and just use my business as a force of good. And also it just helped me through a period of time where I was reevaluating like why I did what I did. One of those that was the purpose of the company. So just thinking about, gosh, my life purpose is to help people. I've always felt this way. And 
So why don't I just make the company's purpose an extension of my life purpose? And so that really also reinvigorated me. Again, purpose being birthed out of your why. And then I think later, about four years later in 2019, I joined EO, Entrepreneur Organization. And that was a big change for me. I'd been striving to achieve more than a million dollars in revenue in order to join EO, which was the, the mark at the time for EO um, to join. You have to be a founder um, or more than 50% business owner, and your business has to make more than $1 million in a calendar year. And so I finally achieved that metric in 2019, joined EO. And through EO, I was introduced to something called EOS, which is totally different. It just happens to be similar letters, but it's entrepreneurial operating system. It was a book called Traction written by a guy named Gina Wickman. And just this whole concept of a methodology or practice or an approach with a framework. In this framework with six components, vision, data, people, issues, process, and then traction helped me form a structure to run my business. I always tell people, like EOS is just one way to do things. If you want to get in shape, there might be a hundred ways to do that, but you just got to pick one and stick with it. So that's what it just happens to be used by lots of other small business owners. So there's just a lot of information um, available for it. There's, there was one more big turning point, but I, I'd be curious. To, yeah, just keep keeping going. I don't want to do all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. I lied, Travis. In fact, for an agency owner, you and me know how difficult it is, right? to initially keep the lights on and then grow the conscious decision which you have made right now to expand and also do optimization and not just stop at building websites. Have that kind of a change in terms of how you would have envisioned when you started versus now making that change, right? So what do you feel the processes or the structures that you have created at Glide to ensure that if, even if that is a change, you pivot to it something, the base is not going to shake it's gonna stand hold when I mean, the fort is still strong to ensure that the regular deliverables are in place while you try something which is not something because of which you started initially yeah so i think if i'm in if i'm hearing your question it's really about like how do you create a plan that when you execute it won't fall apart on you <laughs> and i, I think change management answer, for that matter yeah yeah change management in I think a lot of this is about what is your appetite for risk and taking calculated risks and things like that. And gosh, there's so much to say on this. I ascribe to the concept of the 20 mile march. The 20 mile march is something that was created by Jim Collins and it was uses the analogy or the story that he uses is there were two teams trying to achieve reaching the South Pole. And one team, both teams prepared well, but one team had one approach, the other team had another. The first approach was they would every 20 miles as they were, uh, you know, tracking their way to the South Pole, they would stop and camp. And regardless of how good the weather was or bad, they would stop, they would camp. And then as they went along in these 20 mile days, they would set up uh, resources and supplies and things like that as they went so that on their way back, they would have access to these caches. And the other team, on the other hand, if it was a good day, they'd go 100 miles. If it was a bad day, they wouldn't leave their tent for seven days. They didn't set up caches along the way. And the, there's more to the story, but the concept is that it's just a stark example because one team, the one team that did the 20 mile march daily, they were immortalized, achieved the South Pole, became legends. The other team, everyone died. It's like kind of, you know, tragic. And so he applies this to the business context that there are companies that want to grow 147% in one year, but the next year they've blown everything up and half their team is burned out and left. There's who knows what could, shenanigans could be going on. And so his suggestion is you look at Stryker, pharmaceutical company, or Southwest Airlines, an airline, the only airline to not furlough any employees or Stryker have, having 20% growth year over year for 50 years straight. And so... For me, it's always been about healthy growth uh, and maintainable growth, also work-life balance. I'm a husband and, my, and father of four, and just making sure that not only am I trying to achieve being a visionary leader and successful entrepreneur, but also being a great dad and a great husband. And so finding that work-life balance with that 20-mile march. So we typically set our goals around 25% growth year over year. So that's context. But then back to change management. I think that the beautiful thing about EOS is it uses time horizons. And so you get to look at the world through these different lenses. So you start by getting your leadership team on the same page. Pat Lencioni talks about this in his pyramid where trust is at the bottom. And, but the concept of EOS is, okay, let's, let's envision, let's envision what we want as a company and let's get really clear on it. And then let's think out 10, 10, 15 years and say, 
What's the big vision? What are we trying to accomplish? What's the big, hairy, audacious goal? And then you work backward from that to a three-year picture and you just say, okay, if we're going to close our eyes and reach into the future, what does the company look like three years from now? And each horizon, the fidelity gets clearer and clearer until it becomes concrete. So it's abstract at the 10-year mark and it's crystal clear at like next quarter. And so when it comes to change management, using these time horizons, you don't have to try to get it all done next week, next month, next year. It could be over a three-year period or more. So a good example is casting the vision to the team that we want to be a B Corp. I can put that in the three-year picture. Everybody knows it's coming. And then we can start preparing for in baby steps. One good example and from a change management perspective was our 40 work week journey. Changing as a professional services company from a five day work week to a 40 work week is like insane. If you think about it, if you live and die right. by professional services, by billable hours, and you're taking an entire day off a week or eight hours from billable time, how can that not be detrimental to your success, profitability, revenue growth, and things like that? And so you just can't do that. You can't just make a change from one day to the next. And so for the four day work week, just using that as like a microcosmic example, even though that was a pretty fundamental change for our company, we, I had a four year roadmap for that and I was working toward it. I cast the vision and team. We didn't officially adopt the 40 work week until we started the pilot with the 40 work week organization, a six month pilot in, in April of 2022, completed the six month pilot um, in September and then codified the four day work week as an official benefit applied moving forward. So 2023 was our first full year of having this benefit. So that's the idea of change management. It's just having the foresight to look into the future through time horizons. And so one example related to this major change of services was just looking at our business and saying, okay, in 2019, we had an eight to one ratio of projects to services revenue. And so for us, that means that the vast, what, if you think about it, that's 90% of our revenue drops off a cliff after we're done with a project from just like a tangible financial perspective. It's like a person mm -hmm. just running and jumping off a cliff. Lifetime customer value essentially plummets after the project's complete. And so we really wanted to fix this. And you and I were talking about this earlier, that it wasn't just about how do we extract more money from our clients? Literally the most important thing, going back to your vision, mission, values, purpose, all that stuff was like, okay, if our purpose is to help people who help others, which is our codified purpose, and our vision is to scale impact for purpose-led organizations, and one of our core values is building meaningful relationships, why in the world would we not offer our clients ongoing services that allow us to support them ongoing? And yeah, sure. we were doing support and things like that. And so I had a, so I had a kind of a three-year roadmap for rolling out inbound marketing, starting with organic search and then rolling out paid advertising, because I just felt like top of funnel of all the ways that you can drive additional traffic to a marketing, to your digital marketing, to me, inbound marketing is the most authentic. Inbound marketing is when people are looking for you versus you interrupting them. So it's the difference between a megaphone and a magnet, right? And so I always loved organic search and we already had the skill set. When you redesign a marketing website, you're doing a lot of the things that the SEO requires in terms of one page technical and understanding the organic search engines. Obviously, you're not doing link building, but there's content strategy and all that stuff as well. So the point is, by having these time horizons, we broke down what was a pretty monu monumental goal into bite-sized pieces as we work our way backward through the, those plans until it's, okay, we don't have to build a thriving SEM service offering. We just need to hire one SEO person, or we need to reevaluate how we propose and sell SEO services, or we need to... And so each quarter built on the quarter before in a sequential fashion over a period of multiple years. And here we are now of uh, 2019, we were an eight to one ratio. And now we're at a one to one ratio from projects to services over a four year period. And so that's a huge change. Yeah. Um, it, and it absolutely didn't happen by accident. Each year it was like, okay, eight to one. Okay. This year it's four to one. Okay. This year it's two to one. Okay. This year it's one to one. And that revenue stability is really great because we're a small agency. I still do a, a lot of the sales, if not all the sales. And so for the project, which someday I hope I won't. So taking the burden off me to essentially have to pay for all of our salaries through projects is really great because it, it creates that income stability. So I hope that kind of answered your yeah. question. <laughs> it did, it did, it did. And wonderful. You also made it, now you're a big of 35 company and you also made it 
to INC 5000 recently. So congratulations on that to you and the entire team, Travis. And and, and lastly, Travis, as an agency uh, or as a, someone who is running the show, it, it, at, at times it gets difficult to track and measure the success beyond those traditional financial indicators. So how do you go about ensuring that everything is on track, you are knowing what's happening, what's not, and then how do you ensure that alignment between business goals and you are a very driven person when it comes to your mission and your vision. So how do you ensure that that alignment between business goals and your own mission-driven values are in place? That's an awesome question. And it, it's something that we are like, it's ever evolving. I would say our pursuit of becoming a certified B Corp in 2023, which was a multi-year process. We started in 2022, finished in 2020, was, I would say the biggest, it was almost like a quantum leap in the answer mm -hmm. to that question. So if the question is, how do we ensure alignment between business goals in our mission, vision, values, purpose, by in, in measurement beyond just financial indicators, the B Corp, it, it's like, it forces you to have a framework for accountability, for everything that isn't financial almost. There's a financial component to B Corp where you're looking at things like making sure that your employees are being paid a living wage and understanding other things like that. But for example, when we became a B Corp, you have just a thousand little areas where you get points for stuff. You get point and you got to score an 80 or above in this, in the, at least in the methodology that they're using. I think they're changing the scoring model, but, and it's okay, this one, policy that you have will get you 0.5 points. Okay, good. Now you have 75.5 points left to get. <laughs> and so you, it's a, it's like a, it's a monumental amount of work because you can't just adopt a policy. You have to enact it and you have to live it and you have to prove that you're living it. Like it's a multi-step process. First, you got to identify across all of these different dimensions, whether it's governance or customers or vendors and partners and things like that, or environmental, social, so it is a little bit overwhelming. One of the ways that you can overcome this is by focusing. You don't have to do all the things, but you have to do some of the things really well. And so two areas where we decided to excel is being a purpose-led organization is like saying you're a purpose-led organization is one thing. Anyone literally can just put a headline on their website that says we're purpose-led. That mm -hmm. will take, I don't know, 15 seconds to change your website or maybe 15 hours if you don't know how to do it. But the point is, it's not a complicated thing. And, but to elect an impact business model that's codified through a framework that is then certified by external validators that you're going to give away 5% of your top line revenue. So it's crazy. So to, and then to codify that and to write it into your bylaws of your articles of incorporation is, wow, that's crazy accountability. And so that's one of our impact business models through the, through the B Corp. We had committed to giving away 5% of our top line revenue to vetted nonprofits and purpose-led organizations. And so then we have to track. Yeah. And then we have to track that. And that's done through direct donations, but also pro bono work. So we, and then, so it's funny when we adopted this policy, you never thought it would be so much work to give away money, but it's like just as much work as anything else. And so the second impact business model is a part of our BHAG, which is Within the next 10 years, we want to derive 75% of our total revenue from purpose-led organizations. And this is holding ourselves accountable to our purpose statement. So we have a codified purpose to help people who help others. Our BHAG is in direct alignment with our purpose statement. So if our purpose statement is to help people who help others, then our BHAG, which is, okay, we're making money from the people that are helping other people and we're quantifying it. So it's so that is a perfect example of a metric. While that happens to be a financial metric, it really has nothing to do with the growth of the company or profitability. It has everything to do with what percentage of people that you're working with can you say are helping other people? It better be 75% in 10 years. And by setting that financial metric, it forces me even in sales to say, if I just sit around waiting for people to show up at our door and be interested in our products and services, and they're not purpose-led, we're never going to get to that goal. So we have to be right. proactive and intentional and go out and find those people. And yes, I think that there is a body recomposition, just like when you exercise and your body gets more healthy, where our client, our body of clients is improving. And, and when you profess to the world, here's all the purpose-led organizations we're working with, and more purpose-led will come to you. Because I've always heard in marketing, the best thing you can do is see yourself in someone's marketing. If you have purpose-led organizations, they resonate with our work. And then there's some other intangibles related to what we measure. 
the beauty of EOS, again, is that in these time horizons, there's also metrics that are attached to each horizon. For example, we have a weekly meeting as a leadership team, and we have a weekly scorecard. It, it has uh, essentially four dimensions to it. So the four dimensions, I pulled it up so I could reference it, but we have revenue operations, which includes sales and marketing. We have people operations, which includes the health of our teams. We have client operations, which is the health of our projects and services and client you know, satisfaction. And we have financial metrics. And so we look at those on a weekly basis. And so we can see, and, and all of those should be mostly leading indicators. So for example, for revenue operations, we're looking at things like how many sales calls do we have? How, like how filled is the sales pipeline? And obviously closed deals is on there as well. And then at the quarterly level, we have key measurables, which is a component of US where we're looking at the bigger picture. And those core measurables might be like gross revenue or net profit or maybe some other bigger numbers that don't change and fluctuate quite like on a weekly basis, which would be like net promoter score, which is almost like a biannual type number, which is customer sentiment. And so you take all of these and then you look at your three-year picture and you can extrapolate out, right? So, you know, one of the things we track is the number of reviews collected ac across a couple of key platforms like Clutch and Google and, and other places like that. And so it's like making sure that that we that the reputation of Glide is growing in the marketplace. Um, and so I think these are the ways that we calculate the health of the company. And then like other intangibles for like in our quarterlies and our annuals, like we actually track the number of shout outs that are given. So the number of posts in our ch a channel in Slack called shout outs. And so our goal is we actually have a goal for it. So a weekly goal for shout outs is five, around five per per. I think we had about five per person um, active on the team. We would want to see 20 or 30 of those per week, maybe more. If we have about 20 people or 15 people, I guess maybe 40 potentially. But the point is trying to actually like live out some of these core values of building meaningful relationships. So yeah, a lot of stuff. It's come a long way since, since I first started the company. Lovely, lovely journey, I must say, Travis. Great, yeah, Travis. Uh, it was lovely speaking with you. But before I let you go, I would like to play a quick rapid fire with you. I hope you're game for it. All right. Your favorite spot. I'm going to say football. Football. <laughs> okay. Then in that case, favorite football team. Can be club, can be country. It was the Cowboys, Dallas Cowboys, until they lost their first playoff game. And then I was devastated. My heart was ripped out of my chest. And so now I'm going to say that the Houston Texans. Now, what did you do with your first paycheck, Travis? My very first paycheck? Yeah, first paycheck of your life. Of my life. Oh my goodness. I was 14. I worked at a marina. Um, man, I probably bought back in those days, you like rented VHS movies and, and, and then like Nintendo, Super Nintendo video games to play on the weekend. So I probably rented a movie and a video game and bought some Dr. Pepper. All right. Okay. The last one will not get you any further. Your last. Oh my goodness. What was my last Google search? I don't remember. It was, it, maybe you could add into that now with the advent of chat GPT, because I, I use chat GPT a lot these days instead of search. And so my last search with chat GPT or conversation with chat GPT was about creating a, a quotes calendar for my team so that I can share inspirational quotes. <laughs> Lovely. Great, yeah, Travis. It has been a pleasure speaking with you and I'm sure our audience would benefit a lot out of the insights which you had shared today. So thank you uh, for doing this with us. Really appreciate it, man. Thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful day.